Okay. Here we are. So uh, thanks for coming, first of all. Uh, so uh, I will uh, present so for you uh, of my work um, that I've done at uh, the University of Oslo. But I was also uh, at uh, NVE, the uh, hydrology uh, section, and um, my funded came from uh, Svali, which is a Nordic center uh, of excellence. Um, I was uh, supervised, uh, so one person at the university, Junova Hagen. Uh, my main supervisor was at NVE, that was Miriam Jackson. And I also had uh, Gautu Lagarde from uh, Statkraft. Um, I studied uh, at a very uh, particular place, um, a place um, that is unique in the world, because this place allows you to get access to the glacier bed. And uh, we, have, uh, we have observations that are quite different from normal. And um, we try to understand what are they telling us about the processes at the glassy bed and about the hydrology at the glassy bed. So um, this is Engabrien. Uh, Engabrien is a part of the worst Western Svartisen ice cap located in northern Norway. Uh, south of Buda, north, um, and below this glacier, so you see here these black lines, this is a tunnel network drilled in the mountain. In it's, uh, it's a rock tunnel. And this rock tunnel gives us um, access to uh, the ice 
the ice that is 200 meters thick and we look at the base. Before starting uh, the summary, you need to understand a couple of things. Um, glaciers, every year, every summer, when temperature rises, they melt. And this melt produ is produced at the, at the surface. And this water will try to make its way down uh, to, the, to the sea level. To sea level. And in our case, um, this water is trapped by the crevasses, and this water will go uh, down to the base. And down when the water is at the base of the glacier, um, it may take different form. Uh, it may flow in channels, channels that are big conduits, like pipes, where the water is uh, very efficiently evacuated, because it's very big. And then there is some other parts called distributed drainage system. And in that case, um, it represents most of the glassy bed. So if you look at uh, yeah, a bigger, bigger scale, this is the most important one uh, on a scale spatial base. Uh, but the water has uh, difficulties uh, finding its own way, making its own way. So it goes from uh, cavities. Usually, they are behind uh, small bumps here. And uh, sometimes these cavities interact with the channel system. And channel system is uh, it's a very localized thing. Um, what's important to know is um, the water pressure in these systems is quite different. Um, if you look overall, because the water is trapped in the distributed drainage system, the water pressure is very high. And when water pressure is high, it has an effect on ice dynamics. It can lift up the ice or uh, reduce the friction at the base of the glacier, and then the glacier slides faster. And if it slides faster, it brings more ice to sea level to to the sea, and this can affect sea level rise. Um, we have um, this channel system, and most of the time they are at uh, low water pressure because it's big, so it evacuates a lot of water. But in some cases, where um, either they are very small, like in spring. Uh, they uh, can be actually more pressurized in the system. And they are known to cause a rapid acceleration, uh, rapid speed up in spring. And I will talk about it uh, in a few minutes. Um, and the other thing, so either they are small, but the other thing is sometimes you have so much meltwater, like during a rainfall event, and this will overwhelm the system, and again, rise water pressure, and the glacier uh, slides faster. The problem is this system is very evolves in a very non-linear way. The size, the water, it's a very complex uh, thing. And we try to investigate that now at the lab. But at the lab, we are not sure what we are measuring. Do we measure channels, water pr uh, pressure from channels? Do we measure pressure uh, in cavities? But what it seems that we are looking at is something I've not talked about yet, something called the isolated drainage system. And it's that in these cavities are not connected to anything. They seem isolated. And we are trying to understand this system. And this system was shown in 2014 to maybe control the seasonal um, evolution of velocity of the Greenland ice sheet, meaning that um, this system evolved varies over time, and somehow it was causing a slowdown, a seasonal slowdown, which is a bit different than the classic uh, theory that we have in glaciology. So, what how I divided my my PhD is um, so I, I look at pressure at the glacier bed. I will show you the sensors in a minute, but just to give you a sense of what I've been doing. So I look at how does the uh, pressure changes over the seasons and try to understand uh, the spatial variations that we uh, is be, uh, happening you know, in the glassy bed response. Um, and I, I obtained some very interesting behavior that I then try to explain using a model. And we, we look at a process called load transfer. Then. This explains a, a part of our observations, but there are other parts. And then uh, there are very uh, singular pressure events 
and I've been trying to do a statistical uh, study to understand a bit more what triggers them and what are they telling us about the superficial system. And then I look at this um, s at the springtime when you have suddenly a lot of melt, and which I try to understand um, from measurements from the glacier bed, from the same data, what's happening. Um, to understand these events, I also conducted uh, an experiment, uh, and I will present you uh, an experiment below below the ice. I present you that, and then I also did some uh, some mapping. So using some new technologies that uh, structure for motion, uh, the Kinect, uh, this Xbox uh, game controller that can be used for mapping. But I'm not going to talk about it uh, in this presentation, but we can discuss it uh, with the committee afterwards. So let's go back to Angabra. And so I will show you a bit more how does this um, place look like. So Angabra is a very steep glacier, it's a maritime glacier. There is lots of melt every summer, uh, lots of precipitation. And what's happening is um, the rock tunnel is actually below this point, below 200 meters of ice. So that you get a feel of it, I drew this sketch, and here so you have the tunnel network, and here we get the connection, the access to the glacier base. So that's my PhD. Not spending time at the top of the glacier, which are classic studies, but looking at what's happening below in a tunnel that is wet, cold, uh, and dark. So I show you. Uh, so this lab, this this uh, is it's called the Svartisen Solution Laboratory. It has a, a place where we can live because we live in the tunnel, and then we have a place where we work. And then, if you climb these stairs, this is the door, uh, the door that gives you access uh, to the ice. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about um, data that comes from this place. This is a picture of what happens when you have opened this door and melted with hot water, melted your way um, under the ice. So we have the ice here. Uh, we have some dirt in the ice, if you can see here. And this place here is uh, bedrock, so rock. Um, I have to say, uh, during my PhD, I've worked uh, with Alexandra Messeli, uh, just to acknowledge. Uh, this is uh, her working, giving a skill. Um, we, I will show you then some data from this time last camera. But what's important in this image is also that you see this small instrument that is, has been, we have drilled a small, that was drilled, this, uh, this was drilled actually in uh, 1993, because this place is not recent. It, it was uh, built in 1993 as part of uh, when Statkraft and NV were still uh, together. And it's the aim for this, I forgot to say, is um, for hydro uh, power uh, purposes. So what's important is they can uh, tap the water, sublicial water at high elevation. And if you get it at high elevation, you can use the uh, potential energy to produce electricity in the lower valleys. Um, but let's come back to the sensors. That has been my main, my major contribution. They look like this. And they have a small plate, and this plate measures the pressure of everything that is above. And we have so we have a network of them. So that is the height. You have uh, uh, the uh, it's a DEM digital elevation model. And I show you the door. This is the door again uh, in another view. And since um, 1990, end of 1992. There have been uh, six sensors um, that have been placed at different parts of the bed. And since 1990 1997, uh, some two more were added uh, at this location. And what you've seen in the previous picture is this one. During my PhD, I mostly focused on those two because they have 20 years of pressure data. Something unique. Normally, you only measure pressure at the glacier bed uh, one or two years, 
three years maybe if you're lucky. Uh, but this is a more or less continuous uh, time series. And I also focus on these ones because they show a very interesting behavior. So I'm going to come back to those two, two pairs. What I've tried to answer uh, during this PhD um, is what does the load cell measure? Because we are in a so different system uh, than other, really other studies, we had to go back to this. So I was lucky enough that uh, there was a PhD before me uh, that started to uh, open a bit, try to answer this question. And we realized that sometimes we measure the ice uh, pressure, but sometimes we can measure rocks passing over the load cells, and sometimes we measure water pressure. So what I've been trying to figure out is, uh, what I've figured out is these rocks it's very easy to, uh, to, to, to find because one rock will create one signal at one load cell, not a signal that you see at several of them. So that was one way to eliminate a bit this rock signal. When we have water, water is uh, a system that will never maintain a very high, high pressure. So when the pressure fluctuates a lot and sometimes if you go uh, below the ice pressure, sometimes we measure uh, atmospheric pressure, which means uh, zero, approximately zero megapascal. I mean, uh, 1,000 hectopascal. Um, that was the way to say, okay, we have water flowing over our sensor. So the other thing is we can also measure ice flow. Imagine that you have a car uh, that is driving over a bump. When you hit the bump with the car on the upstream side, you increase the pressure. But as you go behind, if you look at the pressure behind this bump, you have a lower pressure. And this has been um, also uh, s something that could create the signal that we observe, but it's much more, it has been a problem because it's much more complex to identify uh, what is, is it really the cause of the pressure changes. Okay, so that's the different things that we are measuring. And then I decided, OK, uh, let's look at the seasons. Um, because Gauter, who did his PhD before me uh, on these load cells, found out that they were reacting to uh, the melt. So when the water from the glassy surface reaches the bed. But uh, it was a bit more, uh, it was a bit uh, qualitative. And I wanted to do something quantitative. And I used some. Uh, and using quantitative, I could maybe look a bit more at the effect of variations of meltwater, so on the normal stress of the load cells, which is the pressure, more or less. Um, as we have a network of eight sensors, we can look, is it happening at all sensors, these changes, or is it at just one? So the question is, is it homogeneous? Does the glassy bed, you know, is homogeneous? And we are looking at an area of... Uh, 20 meter by 5 meter, so quite a small. So it can be a question to ask. And then, if it's homogeneous, can we find, um, you know, a degree in to some degree um, the connectivity? So what I talked about: Do you have water flowing from one cavity to the other to the channels? Do we have this cavity happening? And so what I did is I looked this at these two load cells, LC6 and LC4, just for. Uh, for you, uh, here is a cross-section of uh, how they are installed. So we have bedrock here. We have the ice. The ice is flowing toward you. And it's a very interesting uh, uh, setup. One is looking thing on top of a overhanging, looking downward. The other one is looking is from the bottom, looking upward. And what I did, I mean, they are, they are a meter apart. Let's look at how do they do they, uh, does the response change over time? And I use this correlation. Correlation is a way to say if you have a signal of one sensor going up and the other, one, the other sensor is also going up, it means that they are correlated. So they move together in a way. But what's if the signal is um, mostly controlled by a lot of noise, then there is no correlation. There is no relation. Uh, between these two uh, pressure. 
And sometimes we can even have negative correlation, which means when one uh, signal goes up, the other one goes down. Interestingly, so what we see is when I applied for these 20 years with a running window, um, I then do a distribution uh, of this uh, data per month, kind of to say for a typical year. And then, so this box here, box plot, this one indicates the median of this uh, variation in uh, correlation. Then you have the uh, 25 and 75% quartile. So it tells you where are uh, the data, where are these uh, correlation. And what you see is it's, it's mostly correlated, looking at the median, but it's quite variable in winter. But we know that in May is happening the first melt, when suddenly the glacier starts moving and s this variability decreases. And when we arrive in summer, this variability is much smaller and we get a very good uh, correlation score. And this goes back in winter, I mean, as the melt stops, the variability comes back. So then it was like, okay, we are saying what we, we talked about. I mean, they are a meter apart, that's what we, sh we, we should see. But there's still a lot of variability. This is quite uh, strange. They're just a meter apart. So the, the one of the things we came out is came out is the sublacial system is highly heterogeneous at the bed, even on a very very small scale. Then what I did. This is not a bookshelf. This is a um, daily daily uh, correlation. So what I did is I took one reference which is LC6, which has the longest, most stable uh, signal. And then I did the correlation between LC6 and LC4. That's what you have seen before. This is for 2003. Then I did also LC6 and LC971. That's the one you had in the picture earlier. And then to another sensor and then to another one. And I picked 2003 because they, um, LC6 and LC4 showed what you've observed in this formograph. So it means it's a bit noisy. You see the variability. It goes from, so yellow means no correlation. Blue means anti-correlation. And red, correlation. So what I've shown you before is if you look at LC6 and LC4 for one particular year, you have an increase in correlation in summer, daily correlation in summer and then it decreases uh, to kind of a, a highly variable level. But what's interesting is data is to not look at the very close sensor, is to look at uh, the data from the others, the other three sensor, and they show this anti-correlation. This is very interesting because there are very, very few um, uh, papers on this. Uh, before 2014, there were only two. And they, uh, however, seems to uh, indicate tell us about a part of the drainage system, so this isolated drainage system. Because what is this, if we look at it a bit more, is it's, um, it seems that there was a channel close to this sensor. And what we think is the isolated drainage system, this one, where AC6 and AC4 are located, shows a correlation. So it's one problem. It, it, it means that if you have one day a measure from pressure and just one instrument, you may have a completely opposite picture of what is happening at the glassy bed. So you need a network of sensors to understand the glassy bed response. What's interesting is, I told you it was, we think that these sensors were, look, were uh, showing a response of a channel. And this is motivated when we look at the discharge uh, curve. So discharge is measured right by the load cell. I told you that you know this hydropower company is tapping the water from, from the glacier, below the glacier. And so it means that it's just beside the load cells. It's subglacial discharge. And this discharge increases a lot. So it means suddenly we have a lot of melt and a lot of water going to the bed. And you see that when the discharge decreases, then we go back to a correlation. So what we seem to see is a channel migrating over the load cells, a very rare observation. And then 
we have a big, big rainfall event in this. That's why we have the discharge increasing. And this is just uh, when this uh, correlation comes back. So what seems to happen is we have a channel that pressurizes and uh, cause actually this very high correlation. So the, it's the water that controls what we measure at the glacier bed mostly. Just a side note, discharge is not the amount of water that you are adding from the surface. Discharge is also uh, variable. Um, it also varies with um, how big channels do you have. Because if you have very small channels, water will, have very, uh, will take a very long time to arrive and to be measured, so to produce a discharge. But if you have big channels, the water would be much more efficient. Just a side note. So that's why I published in Annals of Glaciology, trying to, to say what, trying to explain this anti-correlation. Then I decided um, to look a bit more at this period, look at the sensors, so dig a bit more in the signal. And so we have pressure uh, data for four uh, load cells, LC4, LC6, LC971, LC972. And then I try to characterize, okay, let's have a look at uh, uh, also the meteorology, the hydrology, all these uh, conditions that could trigger this. And I figured out that this uh, LC971 and 2 that show this anti-correlation were varying actually quite um, like, um, like what we know from the boreholes. Boreholes is from the surface observations when people are usually measuring pressure. It, it flows like it's very smooth and very, uh, very responding to the production of meltwater every day because you have a peak in uh, production and then at night there is no melt so it decreases. That's what's happening. Um, what you don't see here but this small signal here is showing the opposite. You can see it a bit more clearer, clearer here but as you have increasing uh, pressure you have a drop. The same here. We increase pressure and we have a drop. So we think that because this is very uh, smooth and um, it must be water pressure from a channel and this must be the isolated drainage system of the ice. Uh, the question was but wow, how do you uh, control, what controls that? What, uh, how do you propagate this, this signal? And then we looked at a process called load transfer. It's, um, it means like um, how do you distribute the weight on something? For example, if I have this pointer, I can lift up this pointer under my finger and this finger can hold all the, the, the pressure, all the weight of this pointer. Um, but it means that if you look at the side of the pointer, the relative pressure decreases because I take all the weight on one point. So that's the same that is happening here. We have this is a modeled uh, finite element model and what you have here is a sublucial channel and what we did is we changed the water pressure in this channel so that it can lift up the uh, kind of increase the pressure um, in this channel which will take some of the load, some of the weight over it but it will decrease the pressure on the side. So and you did, it's a bit tough to show this anti-correlation if I just show you this. So what I will do is I will, uh, oops, I will look at the, the pressure but just at this interface from the channel, actually from the channel and away from the channel. So that's what we have. We have the distance and we have this very little change in normal stress uh, compared to the overall. So it's about 10 kilopascal. So I will run the video now. Oops, I need to click. So the channel is here, and then you have an increase in pressure. Then we decrease the water pressure. But when we decrease the water pressure, 
we actually increase the pressure here, and the opposite. So when what I showed you, we put the pressure under the pointer, this decreases the pressure away from it. So this is load transfer. And we found that we could explain some of our observations. And load transfer is something that's been very little uh, discussed and talked about. And it's in a way to understand how do you uh, propagate a, propag uh, a pressure signal. And how maybe, we have not went so far, but how does the ice react to this? And it's a question of do you cr uh, increase sliding or how do you change the dynamics? We have not reached this point, but we can say load transfer is a very interesting uh, process and we should look at it a bit more. Load transfer is true. I mean, we have so observed it uh, for this period, but sometimes we have something, another signal that we, uh, we observe, and it's these ones, and it's the most classic ones. So you have suddenly a drop, and then you have a very increase in pressure. And I talked to you about in the morning that pressure can increase erosion, and this can sometimes increase by twice the pressure of the ice. So it's as if suddenly you have two ice thickness on top of each other. And so that's what I did then. Um, I tried to look at this. First of all, I needed a data set to do a statistical analysis because there is so much variability. So one way is to do is to gather everything in one, uh, one data set and then uh, try to explain it. So I found a automatic way to get you know this peak, this drop and peak, and that's so a part of the data set, but uh, it counted uh, more than 1,000 events. And then what I did is so statistical analysis. I look at how many of these events, which we call pressure events, do we have uh, for a typical year, and we see that they increase in summer and decrease in winter. Uh, and that's maybe what's creating the correlation that we observe in these seasons, over the season. But there is something interesting, is we can look at when do they occur over the year, but we can look also at the intensity, so the difference between the drop and the, the peak. And this is uh, the result. So we look at the distribution of this intensity. And interestingly, the variability of overall increases in May, when we have the first melt, and it increases a lot in uh, autumn, where it's known that we have a lot of rainfall events, so suddenly a lot of melt water. But in summer, actually, there is little happening. These events are very, very small. And so, what we um, explain, we how do we explain that? We explain that, that the glaciers have um, somehow reacts more to this big melt event where we have also um, the water is very little um, uh, evacuated. So earlier in the year, the drainage system is not developed. And that's why you have a more, much more intense response. And that's more or less the same that uh, the drainage system cannot accommodate the melt water. So that's one thing. We see the role of water and the role also of the capacity of the drainage system. How much water can it take? Then what I did is I looked, uh, I used a, a principal component analysis uh, for this 1,000 events. So I stack them all together and it tells me what is a classic event. How does it look like? And then the variability. And this is how it looks. So over the course of a day, that's uh, the range they have, we start kind of slowly, and suddenly we have an increase in gradient, a drop, and then a rise, sometimes a peak, sometimes not. And the question was, how do we get this drop? And as we thought is due to water, I did the same component analysis, but for the discharge curve. And the discharge curve is um, because it's a cause. I looked at before. So this is uh, 8 o'clock, and we look backwards at midnight. And what we figured out is, so this discharge is all more or less always increasing. And when it's increasing, we have, it means that pressure builds up. And it builds up until this decrease, uh, increase slows down. 
And that's what this gradient is telling us, that here we have the maximum water pressure, and it's more or less what is uh, how that it coincides with this point. So we think that it's a water pressure that causes these events. Now, we had one problem, is uh, we didn't explain, we explained the drop, but we didn't explain the peak. So what we did is we did an experiment where we melted the cavity, um, and we uh, then we had an idea is you know a bridge if you look at the pillars of the bridge um, just below this pillar um, we have an inc I have to say I have to, to do it again um, the pillar of a bridge are actually holding the load the whole bridge itself which means that the bridge that is in the air does not uh, have its uh, as its weight transferred to the pillars. And it's the same, and this it means that this cavity on the side here, it holds the weight of the ice above it. And so we think that we have a, it can explain the increase in pressure. So we did an experiment, we melted the cavity, and we let it close over it. So just to get a feeling, so you, this is a model, uh, ver, uh, model uh, result, but it's what we are looking at. We are looking at that a cavity, that closes over time due to the ice deformation. And then we look at the stress on the side here. And this, um, you have to imagine that the sensor is just on the side of this cavity. So this gray bound here shows you when we melt, we have pressure again over uh, a week. And then we melt, and then as we remove the ice, it drops to atmospheric pressure. But as we let the cavity close, we reproduce this peak and a couple of times. So we met in the second cavity here. We see that this peak is highly variable. And we think it's due to the cavity geometry, because the geometry is always uh, different. This can explain the different types of peaks. As I run a bit later, we'll skip this one, but we can talk about it later. And so the conclusion, um, we think that we are measuring uh, the isolated drainage system. It's uh, a system that is uh, responding to the surface melt and to the pressurization of the channels that we have at the glassy bed. Um, and the response of this, this pressure change, the, the response of the glassy bed, so the pressure changes, are the most important when um, the drainage system is not developed or when we have too much melt water and the system can't take it. And this has, yeah, so we have understood a bit more of this system and described it. We uh, figured out two uh, ways of explaining this pressure signal. And it's looking at the mechanical response of the ice, something that uh, nearly no one looked at, actually, except Gauter, uh, before, uh, in, in glaciology. But it's getting more and more interest because Greenland shows this anticorrelation. So they may have uh, more importance than just Engelberg. And then, um, as I said, it's uh, when we think is when we have a pressurization at the base. And the question remains, actually, uh, we know that pressurization causes the glacier to slide faster. But we didn't have ice flow measurements. So we couldn't answer that. But this can still be, it's a big unknown and something that could be investigated in the future. Thanks. Thanks.